thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, so um, I will talk about ion channel activators and their potential roles in as anti seizure drugs. And uh, to start with, with epilepsy, this is uh, a disease and 65 million worldwide suffers from epilepsy. So it's a quite big problem. And there are two major problems. So existing drugs, they cause severe side effects for many of the patients. And 30% of all patients, they have seizures despite good treatment. Or, well, despite treatment, not good treatment. And this means that there is 20 to 25 million people in the world that need a better treatment. So there is a reason to search for anti-seizure drugs. Uh, I will start with some electrophysiology. You know, all know this, but I would like to point to these two channels, sodium channels and potassium channels. And most anti-seizure drugs today, they act by blocking sodium channels. But there is an alternative, and this is to open potassium channels. So you activate the, the, the break uh, of the brain. And there has been a drug on the market, retigabine. I'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, so, so ion channels, you, all of you know most of it, I guess. And uh, we are focusing on potassium channels. So this is a typical uh, potassium channel. You view it from the extracellular side. And I would like to focus on the voltage sensor domain because most drugs, they're acting on the pore domain. And if you block it, for instance, you can act on the pore domain. Even if you activate it, you can act on the pore domain. So retigabine is acting on the pore domain. But we think that the voltage sensor domain can be a better target. And, and hopefully this is, yeah, so this is, uh, uh, movie illus illustrating how much the voltage sensor S4 is moving from a closed to an open state. And we, we are trying to design compounds that will act on the top of the voltage sensor domain to keep the voltage sensor in an up state. Um, and we are focusing on, on the KV7 channels, especially this KV7.2, 7.3 channel, which is also called the M channel. And uh, as I said recently, retigabine was on the market 2011 to 2017, and this acts by uh, activating this channel. It was a good drug, but it had side effects. Uh, probably some of the side effects was because it's activating KV7.4. So if we're going to develop a drug to activate the M channel, KV7.2, 7.3, we would like to avoid KV7.4. It had also other problems. It, it made the skin blue colored, um, but this was related to the chemistry uh, of the compound. Uh, and the methods uh, we have been using, there are two types, uh, either this uh, two electro voltage clamp technique where we express ion channels in synopus uh, oocytes, but we have also been using uh, automated uh, patch clamp. Uh, and, and we have been using Sophion instruments, uh, Q-patch, but we have also been using other uh, older high throughput equipment. So we have experience with several types of automated patch clamp, and I will come back to this later. And this is a typical voltage clamp protocol. This is in the control solution, a voltage clamp family, current family. And this is what happens if we apply one of our compounds. And it's easier to see what's happening here. We are shifting the GV curve in negative direction along the voltage axis. But there is also an increase in maximum amplitude. And this is important to be aware of these two different effects. And, and this is the most, the shift is the most important effect when we want to design uh, M-channel activators. Um, so, so our uh, start, when we did this experiment, we tested polyunsaturated fatty acid. And there was, in fact, a reason connected to epilepsy. Because there is a, a, a dietary treatment, the ketogenic diet, uh, where the children are eating a very fat-rich diet. 
and some of the children are becoming symptom free. We still don't know the exact mechanism of this diet, but one thing that's happening is that the amount of polyunsaturated fatty acid is increasingly very, very much in the blood, in the cerebrospinal fluid. And, and we tested the effects on voltage-gated potassium channel, and we found a huge increase in current, even though this is a very high concentration of, of uh, the dehydrobiotic, no, sorry, glucose hexanoic acid. And this was caused by a left shift of the GV curve. We could also design uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids with a positively charged uh, end, and this is shifting this curve in, in positive direction along the voltage axis. We call this the, the lipoelectric mechanism because we needed lipophilic compounds and they had to be charged. Um, we also found, uh, which was consistent with the idea, that the number of charges and the position of the charges in top of the voltage sensor S4 was critical for the effect. And so, so this is work that Nina Utteson carried out. So when we added two extra charges on top of the voltage sensor, we could increase the effect very, very much. We call this the super channel, and this has been a tool in our attempts to find new uh, better compounds. And we also tried to, to find the binding site of these polyunsaturated fatty acids. And we found that they are uh, most likely uh, binding between, we can see here, between segment four and segment three from the lipid bilayer at the extracellular end of the channel. So this is the voltage sensor domain. This is outside. This is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. And we made lots of experimental of experiments, and it's consistent with, with such a position. Uh, and, and finally, we also showed that this, these compounds, in fact, are activating the M channel by shifting this curve in negative direction. It hyperpolarizes cell, and it also changes the threshold to generate action potential. So we believe that this super channel, which, which is the shaker potassium channel from Drosophila melanogaster, this can be a good tool to even find M-channel activators. Um, so we, we took two paths to, to find new, better compounds. And we used this channel as a tool. So this is the wild type, this is the, this super channel. And we made a high throughput screen on this super channel to search for new compounds. I will tell you a little bit about this. We also searched the literature for negatively charged lipophilic compounds reported by other groups in the literature in order to find compounds that maybe, maybe can act on our super channel. Uh, so I will start with a screen. This was carried out by, by Per-Erik Lund, and this is, this is not the Sofion equipment. This is from the old uh, Axon instruments. It's not existing anymore. We asked the chemists to go through a number of chemical libraries, and all with a star here, it, he made a selection for us. We want the lipophilic compounds, and they should be negatively charged at, at some uh, at neutral pH. And this is what the typical voltage clamp protocol looks like. And this is the result for one of our hits. You can see in black, it's the control, red with the compound. They clearly increase uh, the current. And this is a summary of all 10,000 compounds. On this axis, we have the effect. This is a tenfold increase in current at a certain voltage. This is a very, very large reduction of the current at a certain voltage. In this gray area is basically no effect, no statistically significant effect. We had some inhibitors, but we had some activators. And we have been focusing on these activators. So 157 of all compounds, they were very clear activators. Um, we divided them in some groups. Uh, this is one group, biaryl sulfone amides. This has been published. I won't talk about it today. We found that many of them, they were carboxyl acids. It's not surprising, but, and this is an ongoing work, but we believe that all of them, or most of them, are acting like the polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, we also have a number of, it's, it's a diverse group of many compounds. This is ongoing work. But I will, a few slides about this very fascinating family. So 59 of all 
157 belong to this class. Uh, we call them warfarin like tautomers because they are very similar to warfarin. Even warfarin is activating uh, the potassium channel. Uh, most of them, or the best activators, on this ac uh, axis you have uh, how much they open the channel or activate uh, the channel. Can't see it. Yeah. This is. Red one. Yes. There. Okay. Okay, it's a red one. So they are very, very lipophilic and they are negatively charged at neutral pH. Then I need two of them. Yeah. Uh, we also tested on a wild type channel. They had a very large effect on the Shaker uh, wild type channel. But the really big surprise, there was no difference between the wild type and our super channel. So the mechanism was completely different. And we tried to tried to find the site of action and we tested on four different types of uh, potassium channels. You can see here the M channel, no effect whatsoever. So it was a failure with respect to epilepsy, but we found it very interesting. We had a large effect on KV 1.5, not the other ones. Uh, we tried to figure out where the binding site could be. And the experimental data suggests it must be on the inside, on the intracellular side. And we found three uh, possible uh, amino acid residues important for uh, the binding. And with molecular docking, we, we identified one side between this S4, S5 linker and the Volta sensor domain, and another side between the S4 linker and the pore domain. Uh, we mutated these two residues and it turned out that the effect was completely gone. So we had identified a new binding site, super exciting, but it was completely unnecessary for our attempts to find an M-channel activator. So instead we, we searched the literature and we found uh, compounds from tree resin and they are activating the wild type channel and more importantly they had a huge effect on uh, on the super channel. Uh, we also uh, tested by changing the charge of the compounds and it fitted extremely well with what we call the lipoelectric effect. If it's negatively charged, we shift the GV curve in negative direction along the voltage axis. If it's positively charged, we shift it in positive direction along the voltage axis. Um, we tried to improve the effect uh, of this uh, or the activity of these compounds. And we, we focused on two different parts. We focused on the charge and we focused on this upper part, which we call the anchor, which is anchoring it to, to uh, uh, the channel. So we start with, um, um, we start with this, this part here. Uh, I think so, yes. Uh, so this is a dose response curve for one of these uh, compounds, dehydroabetic acid. It's slightly dependent on pH because it has a pK value um, not very, very far from a neutral pH. Uh, we introduced a stalk, so we prolonged the distance between this anchor and the charge, and this increased the effect uh, quite clearly. And the reason for this, we believe it's like this. If it's anchored here, this is the voltage sensor S4, this charge will move closer and closer to the voltage sensor, and this will increase the effect. But suddenly when this stalk is becoming more than three amino acid residues, we have very clear experimental data on this. Uh, we believe this is finding a position out in the solution quite far away from the voltage sensors. We have no effect whatsoever. So this was the optimal uh, stalk length. We also tried to, to find, the, uh, to change the anchor up here. And you can see it's almost tenfold increase in affinity by doing so. Uh, so we, we found ways to increase the, the effect of these compounds. And we also showed that we had very clear effects on the M channel. We mutated the top of the voltage sensor domain and we could show that this is critical for the effect. We also showed that it's not at all interacting with the refigabin site. Uh, we also tried to uh, increase the effect by changing the anchor by, by introducing halogens up here. 
so this is, uh, you can call it a kind of mother compound. We are adding one halogen here and another halogen here. This is Rettiga Benesi comparison. If you look at the dose response curve here, this is what I call the mother compound in this case. And all the other ones, they have a fourfold increase in affinity. So just by introducing one halogen, we're increasing the, the affinity quite much. Uh, and what about this KV7.4? I said in the beginning that KV7.4 is uh, problematic. We would like to avoid uh, this channel. And it is super important, super difficult to do this. Uh, but I can show here, this is retigabin. This is a GV curve. If we add retigabin uh, to, to this KV7.4, we see a slight shift of the GV curve in negative direction along the voltage axis. It's difficult to see here, but you can see there's an enormous increase in maximum amplitude. This is eight, sevenfold in this case. And this is a dose response curve. It, it increases up to eight, nine times in the maximum amplitude of retigamine. And this is causing very, very clear and problematic effects on smooth muscle cells, for instance. If we in, instead try one of our compounds here, you can see that there is a, an increase in the maximum amplitude, but it's, it's very, very small, and this is a dose response curve. So we believe that there is an enormous difference between our compounds and retigabin with respect to KV7.4. Uh, we also uh, made effects on uh, mesenteric artery and there is a tenfold difference in, in uh, effect uh, or affinity of retigabin and uh, one of our compounds here. These Wu compounds, they are, they are named after our chemist. His name is Wu. Um, and finally, um, we also were interested, will our compounds have an effect on an epilepsy model, a simple epilepsy model. And this is a zebrafish larvae model. It looks like this. We put an electrode close to the brain or whatever it is in the zebrafish larvae. So it's an extracellular recording of, of activity. And this is a controlled recording. This is a 10 minute. And as you see, there is very, very little electrical activity. We can, in, by adding this PDZ, which is a classical compound to induce epileptic seizures, uh, there is a dramatic increase in electrical activity, and we have some classical uh, uh, pattern uh, uh, indicating epileptic seizures. And we, when we add our compound here, it's basically going back to, to um, background control. Um, and, and here uh, is the concentration needed to, to get, get rid of these epileptic seizures. We have retigabin here. In our hands, we need 10 micromolar. This is a second generation retigabin derivative. It's much more effective. We need only one micromolar. And here are our own developed compounds. And as you can see, some of them, all of these are, are equally good as retigabin or even better. And we have even some that are at the same level as newly derived retigabin derivatives. Um, so we think this, it's possible to develop new anti drugs acting on the top of the voltage sensor domain. And to conclude, um, we uh, have found that uh, um, we can open shaker potassium channel, but also this human M channel via an electrostatic mechanism, and the negative charge is critical. It's located here. We have also shown that we have an anchor, and we can increase the effect by this compound by uh, introducing halogens in this anchor. And the stalk here is critical for the effect. So if we introduce two extra atoms, we can increase the effect. Three atoms is too much. And we have also shown that uh, the top of the voltage sensor domain is critical for, for the effect. And finally, uh, we can prevent seizures in the zebrafish larvae model. And, and the people who did this work, and this is basically the authors of the old papers I've cited here, 
so this is my lab in electrophysiology. My lab is far from this size. Uh, it's, it's not at all true, but they have been working in the lab during last, let's say, 10 years or so. In green, I have some of the critical ones. Uh, Sara Lin has done most of the work on the pollen saturated fat test, but also this viral sulfonamide that I did not talk about here today. Perik Lund did the screen. Nina Ottosson did the work on the resin acids, but also some pollen saturated fatty acids. Ole Rönnelid is a PhD student. He has been working on the carboxyl acids found in the screen. And then finally, I would like to mention uh, Malin Silver or Eineby, who have been working on the resin acid, but also the tautomers. Uh, I've been collaborating with chemists, with people doing molecular dynamics and physics. I would like to point, point out Xiong Wu, the chemist, and his boss, Peter Conradson. These are people doing molecular dynamics. We have collaborated with Lucy Dalamat in Stockholm, Eric Lindahl in Stockholm, and Björn Wallner at Linköping University. And here are also some other collaborators doing part of the work. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for this is very interesting talk. We are now open to questions. Gerhard. Uh, great talk. I have a question, a, a technical question. Do you find differences depending on the composition of the lipids, depending on the cell type that you're using? Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so we haven't uh, systematically changed the lipid bilayer. We have done experiments on different cell lines. We have done it in, in uh, Zinipus oocytes. And, and our compounds, we basically don't see any differences. No. Frederick, very nice talk. Yes. Uh, so what is the specificity of these uh, compounds uh, within the casing Q family or outside of the casing Q family? Yes, uh, that, that's also a, a very good question. Um, I did not show any data. We have tested some of the compounds on, on sodium channels. We have tested on calcium channels. Uh, we have tested on, on uh, other potassium channels, especially these uh, uh, cardiac safety uh, panels and so on. And we have no effect on these channels. Um, I'm not saying that they are selective. You have seen we do have some effects on, on uh, KV7.4. Uh, we have not tested KV7.1 very carefully. So this is something that, that also must be, be done. Um, if I just say one, one thing more is that it's, it's interesting how very, very small changes in the compound can cause dramatic effects. So one example is that just by changing the chirality of where this carboxyl group is located, we can change the compound from having a large effect to no effect. So, so my, my, I mean, many people, they are questioning, is it possible to get this, them selective if they're acting from the lipid bilayer? And I think it's definitely possible, but we don't know exactly how to do it. So great talks. Um, uh, Sue from Korea. My question is that have you, uh, uh, is the repeat uh, kind of compound, is it washable? Usually wash out after? Wash in and wash out of the yeah. compound. It, it's fairly quick, I must say. Even though they're lipophilic and we believe that they are uh, introduced in the lipid bilayer. So, so wash in, we are talking about uh, seconds maybe. Wash out, it can take uh, minutes or so to wash them out, but it's, in general, it's, it's no, no big problem. No big problem. Okay. And we, we don't have any specific tricks to, to get them out from there. And also, you have it tried on the uh, kind of a neural, neural excite, excitability? Uh, neural, neural excitability, yes, 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 yes. We have tested on neural excitability. So we have tested on, on, um, on, on, on brain slices, we have tested on DRG neurons and so on. And, and we have clear effects on neuronal excitability, yes. Uh, do, I have a question. Yep. Do they pass the, the BBB? Uh, yes, they, they pass the BBB. Yes, yes. they do. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, they, they do. So you tested it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's tested, yes. Okay. So I think there are no more questions. Thank you very much again for the yep. beautiful talk.